Welcome everybody. Tonight's panel event is titled Article 81 Guardianships During COVID-19, Perspectives from the Bench. I'm Kimberly George, President of Project Guardianship and co-sponsor of this evening's webinar. Project Guardianship was founded in 2005 as a program of the Vera Institute of Justice to fill a gap in the justice system that left unprotected a population of largely low income aging adults and people with disabilities and mental illness who lack family and other supports. Since its founding, Project Guardianship has demonstrated that a nonprofit program centered on human dignity can enable people with little resources and support to live more safely and independently while also saving public dollars. Project Guardianship offers a comprehensive model of guardianship. Each client has a multidisciplinary team consisting of an attorney, a case manager, and a finance manager, and the client teams are supported by a benefits coordinator and a property manager. We specialize in keeping people in their homes and out of institutions, as well as moving people back home. We also have expertise in making end of life decisions in accordance with the law and in accordance with the client's wishes. We serve as guardian to clients regardless of their ability to pay, and we have the capacity to provide services for the most complex cases. We also provide research and recommendations for a better guardianship system and advocate for more equitable responses to providing services for people who need protective arrangements. This includes working with partners to find solutions that not only improve guardianship, but also divert people from guardianship whenever possible. We are therefore grateful to be partnering with Legal Health at New York Legal Assistance Group to bring you tonight's panel, which is part of a series of webinar events that are intended to be opportunities to hear from experts on different guardianship topics and to begin to form a reform agenda for a coalition around Article 81 guardianship. A colleague will tell you more about the coalition in a moment, but first I'd like to pass it over to Stu Sherman to introduce our co-sponsor, Legal Health. Um, thank you so much. Um, I'm Stu Sherman, Senior Staff Attorney at Legal Health and the founder of its Guardianship and Guardianship Alternative Practice. Legal Health is a division of the New York Legal Assistance Group. It was started in 2001 and is celebrating its 20th anniversary this year. We provide free legal assistance to New Yorkers who experience serious or chronic health problems and financial hardship. We have clinics in 35 hospitals and health centers, including many of New York's public hospitals. We bring together legal and medical professionals to improve the lives of clients and address social determinants of health. Our attorneys assist with a wide range of civil legal matters, including housing, immigration, public benefits, family law, advanced care planning, and health coverage access. In 2019, we identified the need among our clients to assist with relatives that have lost capacity. The family members were unable to talk to, uh, to get help for their relatives without capacity because they did not have legal authority to do so. As a result, they couldn't speak with banks, health insurers, pension funds, or government agencies. This get disconnect left many individuals without the ability to get needed healthcare services for their loved ones, including home care services necessary to maintain care in the community instead of nursing homes. In 2020, with the support of the Fan Fox Foundation, we developed a project to assist these families by finding guardianship alternatives and, when none are available, assisting with guardianship petitions. This coalition and today's event is an extension of this work. Um, and now I'm gonna pass it over to Beth Williams who will tell you a little bit more about the coalition we're building uh, for, uh, for the future. Hey, um, thank you, Stu. And good evening, everybody. My name is Beth Williams and I serve as the Deputy Director of Legal Services for Project Guardianship. I'm gonna share a little bit about the coalition that's sponsoring this event, and then I will introduce our panel of judges. And after that, we'll get started with the discussion that you have been waiting for. Um, so Project Guardianship and Legal Health have joined forces to establish the Coalition to Assist Limited Capacity New Yorkers. Our aim is to join with other organizations and stakeholders who regularly work with people with diminished capacity, including healthcare providers, nonprofit organizations providing services to people who are aging or living with disabilities, legal aid providers, judges and policymakers, among others, to communicate about the issues facing this population and the systems that serve them. In addition to this evening's event, the coalition will sponsor three other webinar events in 2021. 
We plan to hold an event on guardianship in rural communities in New York State, as well as an event on guardianship in the context of disability rights and supported decision making. We will also host a discussion with national experts who focus on guardianship and guardianship reform. So stay tuned for announcements about those upcoming events. It's our hope that through our efforts to share information that we will continue to identify service gaps, uh, develop practical solutions, and draw attention to the need for reform at the state and the federal level. Uh, at the conclusion of this evening's event, we will send an email to the attendees with a link to sign up for more information about the coalition. And we will also include a link to a survey where we hope you will provide your feedback on the event. So expect that to arrive in your inbox uh, after the event. Um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our distinguished panel of judges. Um, first up, uh, we have the Honorable Lisa S. Otley, who is Acting Supreme Court Justice in Kings County, Brooklyn, where she provides over guardianship matters, a motion part and trials, and she was elected to civil court in 2008. In 2010, she was appointed the supervising judge of the civil court. As supervising judge of the civil court, Kings County, she, provide, she presided over the trial assignment part in civil court. Prior to her appointment as acting justice of the Supreme Court, she presided over cases in both the civil and family court in Kings County and arraignments in criminal court. And we are happy to have Judge Otley with us tonight. Um, the Honorable Wyatt Gibbons is a Supreme Court Justice in Queens County, where he presides over guardianship matters. Justice Gibbons began his career as an Assistant District Attorney in the Queens County DA's office. He was Assistant Attorney General with the U.S. Virgin Islands Attorney General's Office in St. Thomas, and then he spent 27 years in private practice, where he focused mainly on criminal defense and Article 81 guardianships. He tells us that he has worn every hat in the Article 81 guardianship world, with the exception of court examiner. The Honorable Charles M. Troya is Acting Supreme Court Justice in Richmond County. He presides over a guardianship part, a civil case management part, a civil mental hygiene part, and a medical malpractice part in Richmond County. He serves as chairman of the Guardianship Roundtable for the first and second departments, co-chair of the Guardianship Task Force for the second department, and he is a member of the 18B Advisory Panel. He lectures extensively on guardianships and mental health. He also serves on the Court of Claims, having been appointed by the governor last summer. Judge Troyer resides in Staten Island and is a second generation native Staten Islander. The Honorable Lisa Sokoloff is acting Supreme Court Justice in New York County, where she also presides over guardianship matters. Justice Sokoloff is currently a member of the New York Supreme Court Gender Fairness Committee and a former co-chair of the Gender Fairness Committees of the Manhattan Civil and Criminal Courts. And finally, the Honorable Tatanisha James is a Supreme Court Justice in New York County where she presides over the integrated part. Cases are transferred to Judge James's part when a tenant living in New York County is the subject of both a civil court housing part case and a Supreme Court Article 81 guardianship case. Upon transfer, both cases are combined and adjudicated by Judge James, thereby eliminating the need for an alleged incapacitated person to appear before two different courts. So this is our panel of judges and we thank all of them for joining us this evening. We appreciate you sharing your time and your knowledge and we hope this will be a lively discussion. Uh, with that, I turn it over to John Holt, who will moderate the panel discussion this evening. Thanks, Beth. Uh, I'm John Holt. I'm the Director of Legal Services and Policy for Project Guardianship. I'm very excited to be moderating our panel discussion this evening, and I want to extend a big thank you to all of our distinguished panelists and to everyone who's taking time uh, this evening to be in attendance. So thank you. We have a number of topics that we hope to cover, but before we jump into the discussion, uh, a reminder to our attendees. Please use the Q&A function uh, throughout the program to post questions for the panelists. We have saved about 25 minutes at the end of the program and uh, we will hopefully get as many of these questions asked to the judges as possible. So uh, don't be shy. Please pop as many questions as you can into the Q&A and we'll try and uh, get them to the judges. Uh, and now our first question is going to go to Judge Troya. Uh, Judge, 
any discussion about the future of guardianship is necessarily going to have to take into account the experiences of this past year. But it's also arguable that the pandemic served to highlight and heighten the strengths and weaknesses that were already latent in our guardianship system. How would you characterize the state of guardianship immediately before the onset of COVID-19 way back in March of 2020, if you can remember that far back? Well, Judge, I think you're, uh, you're actually muted. So our first... Uh... I'm sorry about that. Uh, we're not used to muting when we're on um, these Teams, Skype, Zoom, whatever it is. We're always the ones that are unmuted. Um, it, just before we began uh, this presentation, I mentioned that, you know, we're almost about exactly one year ago where all of this started. And when all of this started, when the virus started, the pandemic started, none of us really had any idea what it was that we were going to be dealing with. Quite frankly, I thought it was something that was going to be over in a few weeks. Um, as I said earlier, when they canceled the St. Patrick's Day Parade in Manhattan, I realized that there were issues um, and that this was serious. And it did have a great, great detrimental effect uh, to the guardianship world. It, it really did. We deal with, as everyone can appreciate, uh, the most vulnerable, the ones that were hit the hardest by this pandemic, by this virus. It's not just individuals that were in nursing homes. It's individuals that are elderly. It's individuals that suffer from some type of uh, prior mobility uh, issues. It's individuals that have uh, modalities issues. These are the individuals that were hit the hardest and certainly the courts were hit, the guardianship parts were hit the hardest. I don't think we've ever seen uh, the loss of so many of our wards in such a short period of time. Uh, we're still calculating on that. And yes, it, the effect on us was devastating, but what it also showed us was the weaknesses and showed us that we really do have a bar and bench committed uh, to succeed even during this pandemic. And I've never seen uh, a bar respond so well to an emergency as I did with the elder law bar and the judges that preside over Article 81s. We used, and you'll hear from my colleagues as, as they address uh, what went on for us with them, the pandemic, the different avenues um, that we chose to follow to ensure that our wards were protected, to ensure that we were available to address every emergency situation. But yes, even prior to the pandemic, um, there were issues with guardianships. You know, there is absolutely uh, no such thing as a perfect system. But I will tell you, we have a, I personally think we have a wonderful system in New York. Um, is it perfect? Absolutely not. But again, perfection does not exist in this world. Our greatest need, which existed prior to the pandemic, which exists now during the pandemic and will continue to exist after the pandemic, is the need for not-for-profit agencies to be available to serve as guardians for our wards. That is a need that will not change. And yes, I, I've, I've spoken uh, at various events where Project uh, Guardianship uh, was present. Um, when you released your report, I guess two years ago, this two, 2020 seems like a, a complete blur. So it throws you off on, on time spacing. Um, and I've, I've lauded the work of Project Guardianship when it was Guardianship Project, when it was the Vera Institute. But what I will say is we need more. We need individuals, we need agencies that are willing to help those that truly have nothing. Because not if, if an individual has family, if an individual has finances, then yes, we can always find a guardian for them. But we need agencies such as Project Guardianship, not-for-profits that are willing to uh, pick up the slack, to fill the gap, and the gap is huge. Regardless of the pandemic, it still exists. Um, I would, at this time, like to turn it back to you, Mr. Holt, because I know that the individuals here on this pre presentation are truly, truly concerned with how we reacted and how we're moving forward with the pandemic, and that they will be addressed by my colleagues, and I would like to get to that portion. 
Yeah, absolutely. And, and before we um, jump into some of the questions that'll kind of highlight that, I'd like to open it up to the panel if anyone else has a response just in terms of kind of what you saw as the, the baseline of the guardianship system before we entered in the pandemic and uh, maybe speak a little bit about some of the, the strengths and uh, uh, weaknesses of the system as you see them from the bench. And judges, I think all of you are muted, but I can, um, I'm not sure if I have the ability to unmute you, but um, Judge Sokoloff, if you'd like to respond. Yes, I completely agree with Judge Troya um, that the lack of guardians for uh, poor people with no families has always been an issue and certainly the pandemic amplified that. Um, another issue that I see um, that has existed before um, and still exists um, uh, is the fact that there's no source for compensation for court evaluators. Um, so if you're dealing with um, poor people and there's no asset base from which to pay them, um, not having a source of compensation, you can always get mental hygiene legal services uh, to act as attorneys for, um, for, for poor AIPs and you can, um, uh, you can get uh, attorneys who are willing to accept the 18B rate, as paltry as it may be, but um, it's least some money. Um, but there's very little, unless you're dealing with an institution like a hospital, um, that there is no, there's no, there's no, no, no source of funds. And the, Court evaluators, as the eyes and ears for the court in many ways, are the most important um, and pivotal um, part of any case. A good court evaluator um, he can make a judge's life um, so much better and help a judge come to the most informed decision. And um, it, it's awful to have to beg or to have to have your court attorney beg people to accept those um, positions because there's likely to be no pay. Um, and, and I think that if we could resolve that, or um, I understand now because of the pandemic and the budgets um, issues all over the state, but certainly uh, the city's budget that there's unlikely to be a source of funds. Um, but that's something that we should try to address um, because without compensation for people who really do the hardest work at the beginning of the case, um, you're not going to get the best possible outcomes. From our perspective, I think one of the interesting things we saw before the outbreak of, of the pandemic was um, some interesting pilot programs that we're trying to get other professionals, non-lawyer professionals uh, in as guardians. What do you think, um, and this is for the entire panel, anyone who wants to respond, uh, do we think we have the right mix of, of skill sets in terms of the people who were willing to serve as guardian? And should we consider that if we're talking about monetary enticement for people to serve as guardian in the future? Well, I think that the, I think what we've, we've come to the conclusion is the skill set uh, to serve as guardian is certainly um, more than just an attorney. We look to social workers, we look to nurses, we look to teachers. And yes, uh, John, you're right there. Just before the pandemic hit, just before this uh, incredible budget crunch that we were subjected to after the pandemic hit, there were a variety of programs that we lost as a result of the budget. Smaller programs, but every little bit helps. And I believe, uh, you might have been involved with some of them out on Long Island um, that had started. And it's a shame that we lost them. And because those focused on sets, uh, skill set other than attorneys, social workers and nurses, uh, to me, are, are one of the, the greatest resources that we can go to. You know, a lawyer goes to law school. I went to law school. I can understand the law. I can uh, handle myself in a courtroom. But if you ask me what route to find someone assisted housing, I couldn't tell you. 
That's what a social worker is, is designed to do. That's what a social worker is trained for. That's their educational background. Uh, supportive housing is a great need in um, most of our cases. Um, nursing, uh, geriatric nurses are a very, very big force with us. You know, something that uh, Judge Sokoloff and the other judges from New York County started was an outreach, which is, is really important, which we can, if we can use this opportunity to put in a plug for it, I would like to. Um, what we're trying to do is get individuals I don't know if my computer died. No, we can see and hear you, Judge. Back up, okay. My screen went blank. Individuals um, of a, a diverse group of individuals to serve as both counsel for the alleged, incapacit uh, alleged incapacitated person and as court evaluators. We want individuals that speak a variety of different languages, that from, come from different cultures, that come from different backgrounds. You know, when we preside over a case, all right, we're advised from a court evaluator as to what a particular individual is doing. We need, in order to properly serve that individual, we need to understand that individual. We need to have a good insight into their culture, into their background, so that we can assist them in continuing to live the life that they would want to live, not by our standards, but by their own standards and by, by their own beliefs. And to have individuals the vast array of cultures with information that they can provide to the court to explain to the court, no, this is how this person, th this is their culture. Understand this. It makes it easier for us. Individuals from different backgrounds that speak different languages, all that. The more diverse we have individuals on our OCA approved panels to serve as court evaluators, and to serve as counsel to AIP and to serve as guardians makes our ability to do our jobs so much easier and so much more successfully. And that serves our community. Judge Sokoloff was the one that was leading this, this effort. I believe with Judge Rosado, I'm not exactly sure. Judge Sokoloff. Um, do you mind if I comment? Um, no, please do. Yes, um, Judge James and my colleague Judge James and my colleagues Mary Rosado and Carol Sharp and I um, commenced a, a guardianship diversity initiative at the end of last year because we felt there weren't enough African Americans and um, individuals from different backgrounds, particularly bilingual individuals who are in the practice um, that we could appoint as attorneys for the AIP, um, as court evaluators, and as guardians. And um, we did decided to do something about it. So we did some outreach to all the different bar associations, the affinity bars, they're called. And, to, and we were co-sponsored by, um, through our dear friend, uh, Joanne Quinones, um, um, by the um, Franklin H. Williams um, Judicial Commission. And we, we launched a program and we got a wonderful response. And um, we're gonna be speaking at the round table of judges next week about expanding um, our outreach um, to bring more people in. We had a great initial program, people signed up. And um, at the insistence of my colleague, Carol Sharp, uh, we didn't want anyone to be brought in and to be um, hanging by a thread, so to speak. So we, um, the, um, the Elder Law Committee of the New York Women's Bar Association has been assisting us and they put together um, a mentorship uh, program so that everyone who joins the guardianship diversity initiative will be paired with someone who will give them assistance, help them with forms, answer their stupid questions. And we've encouraged um, everyone who's joined um, to reach out to our court attorneys directly. And um, I'm not going to speak for Judge James, but I will tell you that the, the people that have reached out to my part, we've given them assignments and they've done a great job. And we're really thrilled 
um, with the people that have been brought in and we hope to bring in more people um, to expand the pool of people uh, in this practice and um, just to help with general diversity throughout the system. So that sounds, do, sorry, have you had a good experience, um, Tatanicha? I have. I've, uh, the response has been wonderful. And uh, not only have I had individuals seeking to serve as court evaluator, attorney for the AAP, I've actually had the opportunity actually just last week to assign, appoint a, a mentee and a mentee, so a new person who's new to this world as a guardian. Uh, she will be working under the guidance of a seasoned veteran but it's one of those low asset cases where you know it's usually really hard to find a guardian to serve um and this mentee is using this as a learning opportunity and uh i feel comfortable that safeguards are in place because there's a mentor like i said a veteran who's going to be there with her every step of the way and um, i'm really proud of this project that uh judge sokoloff uh thought of and brought to fruition really amazing. It's these kind of innovations that are really going to serve us well, especially in these kind of uh, trying times. Um, and it's a good segue to our next question for, for you, Judge Atlee. Um, you know, obviously, the uh, entire world changed in March of 2020, and our guardianship system was no exception. What do you see as the biggest impacts that the pandemic had specifically on court personnel and procedures, and how successful have we been as a court system in addressing those impacts? Good. Evening, everyone, um, and thank you for inviting me to uh, be a part of the panel. So, of course, it's had a tremendous impact on the guardianship um, parts um, in the system in general, because what we're used to doing is having everything readily available to us. And I think, um, and Judge Troy can also speak to this because he sits on the advisory committee, but our concern was once we get underway, well, um, you know, how are we gonna get the documents? Um, and some of these documents having been um, personal documents, medical information. So if we're uploading, downloading, whatever they're calling it on NYSEF, um, who's gonna have access and who's gonna be able to look at these documents? So that was key for me because while we're talking about guardianships, I don't always allow everyone in my courtroom because there's certain information that just should not be out there. And um, that was some of the, uh, the issues that came up. Who's going to have access? I know a lot of the court evaluators were concerned about their reports. So in terms of NYSEF and what goes on our system, that's one of the things that shouldn't be up on the system um, and accessible to everyone. Um, the ability to put that information out there who has access to the files and so on and so forth has been a tremendous concern. It's been a concern for the attorneys, whether or not they should turn over certain documents. Um, and once the petition is in fact filed, the judges actually getting those petitions in time so that we can read them, address them, sign off. A lot of things have happened but I think overall that we've seen an, impro an improvement in how these things are being handled computerized because other, you know, we had a file, the file would come up to us, we'd have it readily available, we'd calendar it. Now we are waiting for everything to come to us. So the e-filing system, I think it's been moving better. It was much slower initially, but it's gotten better. And I think that most of the attorneys, while there's been some hiccups, it's gotten better and it's working. Judge, do you think there's any concerns we should have about um, access to the e-filing system for, for lay guardians, for people who are potential petitioners who may not have the same access to a computer or internet? Um, and how should we take that into consideration as a court system that serves a very vulnerable population? Well, I know that for people who've had problems, even attorneys and judges in terms of having access to the files. If it's mailed into us, and I know that I've received um, self-represented litigants who come in seeking guardianships, it gets to me eventually. But when my law clerk is in or my secretary is in, 
they check the email, the map email, the uh, regular mailbox because it will be sitting in there. And so we get it upstairs. Um, we have a limited amount of personnel in terms of non-judicial staff in the courthouse, but we're still managing. So we have, you know, if you mail it in, if you come in, and I know that's happened in, in Kings County, that's kind of difficult, but we do get the phone call if we're, you know, to say someone's trying to file something, we can't let them in the building, what do we want them to do? So a lot of different things have happened, but most of the time the mail, so, it, it, you know, we're taking the hard copy. Judge uh, Gibbons, I know you took the bench when a lot of these changes were already in effect. I'm curious what your viewpoint is as someone who, who came into guardianship when you filing and, and a lot of these changes already um, were, were happening. Well, you know, for me, because I'm the newbie on the block, uh, I didn't really know the backroom uh, office procedures of the court itself. Uh, I was a practitioner uh, up until the day I got elected. And uh, I knew that I sent my papers in and somehow they magically made their way to a judge who signed them. And then I was told when to appear in court. Um, so I've kind of had the benefit of not having to unlearn an old system. And I was really, I broke my, my, my tea. I, 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 you know, started, uh, just in the new system. There are uh, obviously residual uh, cases, you know, they're not all e-filed now, uh, but uh, you know, those, I again had to learn how that system worked and I didn't have uh, any background to determine if it was, you know, working the same as it, as it always had been. I'd assume that, that it was, you know, in light of the pandemic, probably a little bit slower uh, because everyone's getting used to the new system, the staffing is down. I know the guardianship part was up the entire time uh, of the pandemic, and you know, though they had to work with uh, uh, less staff and on rotation basis, nobody stood down during that time. I know my uh, colleague Lee Mayerson and, and and Bernie Siegel, they were working nonstop. I know the clerks were working nonstop to keep up with the backlog, to keep up with the new stuff that was coming in. Um, and I mean, I've described it as like the post office. I mean, it never ends. There is paper all the time. And one of my, uh, one of my initiations into this was, I didn't know that there was a drawer in the guardianship part where all of my orders and papers are stored until they're brought up to me. And the, when I found out about that, there were about literally like 60 different orders and documents that needed to be reviewed and signed. And when I didn't get to it right away, the next day there was like another 20. So it scared me. And I realized that this is something you have to stay on top of every minute, uh, whether it's e-filed or it's the old uh, a hard copy system, there's so much stuff. Uh, and the e-file, I guess, only adds to it because now it's so fast. It, it goes, you know, right from the e-file system to the guardianship clerk and they send it to me via email. And our, our, email, uh, our email mailboxes are constantly filled. We, we have a, series, a system now where my clerk red flags everything and we divide and conquer. And we, you know, that way we know who's done what. We'll take the flag off and replace it with a check. So I know that he's done this you know, th this uh, motion has to get out. I've done this order the show cause that just came in and try and stay on top of it. So it, I don't really know how, how different this system is. I just know how it is now. And it is busy. Let me tell you. Well, the, the other big change has clearly been the, the use of, of virtual hearings and conferences. I'm curious what the experience has been of the panelists and, and how well that's been working, especially for AIPs, people who have differing abilities to use technology, and, and how is that addressing um, the needs of people in, in the guardianship system? Well, for me, I think generally that my uh, team's hearings have been going well, even in terms of when we have to get an IP <laughs> on when the appearance is not being waived and we have to go into the nursing homes. The nursing homes and the facilities have been um, cooperative and they've worked with us in making sure that the IP has a private room, whether it's in their particular room or what they deem to be a community room. They will have their caseworker there or the person who is working with them so that they can be seen whether or not the individual has the ability to communicate. But 
I know that I always say, we'll just put the camera on the individual so that we can see and whether that person is nodding or smiling and so on and so forth. So I think for me, it's been good other than one thing, and that's if it's a very heavy contested um, guardianship and we're starting to deal with um, exhibits and I have to tell the attorneys, it hasn't changed. Just pretend that you're in person. You still have to mark your exhibits. You still have to ask the proper questions in terms of getting it in, in terms of foundation. Nothing has changed. It becomes a little bit more difficult for the attorneys. I have one now where a case, they have video that has to be translated. And I said, well, listen, if it's that difficult for all of you, step as to those that you can actually agree to put into evidence and let's move it forward. But that's the only difficult part right now. I think that we've been moving along very smoothly in, in my part. Um, I think most of the attorneys have been happy that they'd be able, they'd able to move in and out uh, without any difficulty. I'm going to uh, move to a, a related but slightly different um, angle of this uh, COVID impact. Uh, this question uh, goes to you, Judge Gibbons. So uh, the disruptions to our lives and the restrictions that were put in place to reduce the threat of COVID have clearly made it more difficult for guardians um, to act on behalf of the people that they've been appointed for and for examiners in the courts to oversee the work of the guardians. Uh, I know you had mentioned you served as a guardian in your private practice. How do you think the pandemic has changed the way guardians have had to do their job um, and how's the court had to adapt their compliance and oversight to reflect those changes? Uh, I think that a, a lot of the impact on the guardians, it, it might be a little early uh, for me to tell based on any feedback from them. Uh, but uh, the obvious issue that jumps out is, is a logistic one. Uh, you know, how does a guardian adequately oversee their ward without being able to physically see and interact with them? Now, you know, if an if an IP is uh, in a facility, then there's generally staff that can inform them of any particular needs, but an IP in the community is generally a little more difficult to assess and then aid. And, and that's you know, especially true for the Part 36 guardians. Uh, similarly, I think some of the routine tasks that would need to be accomplished by a guardian, um, especially in the beginning stages of a guardianship, such as uh, uh, rep payee uh, for Social Security or for VA benefits, uh, establishing bank accounts, liquidating existing ones. Many of these institutions are still going to require in-person visits. Certainly government offices are more backed up now than they've ever been. And unless there's some prior relationship at a bank, setting up a new guardianship or trust account uh, is going to require a, a physical appearance. Uh, also, liquidating funds or inventory safe deposit box will certainly require personal appearances. So those types of roadblocks uh, are, are going to be encountered. I haven't had anyone come back to me yet. I only started making appointments around middle September. And I like to think that the people that I've appointed uh, are well-versed in this area. So when they hit a roadblock, instead of rushing back to the court, they try another avenue and then they try a third avenue maybe a fourth avenue before they would say you know i got to go back to the court for some direction so that's why it might be a little too early to tell uh, but i think one of the most critical uh, issues especially for the part 36 appointments are establishing a relationship and rapport and trust with your new ward uh, who generally you're not going to know from a hole in the wall right the part 36 guardians this is a business they do this as their job and uh, it's not a family member so you know you the the ward doesn't know you from a hole in the wall and suddenly you you burst into their orbit uh, sometimes foisted upon them against their will uh, and you take over these intensely personal and critical aspects of their prior lives. It's kind of like, hi, you don't know me, but I'm redirecting all of your assets into an account that I'm going to control, and I'm going to collect all your mail, and I'm going to move you out of the only home you've ever lived in, and I'm going to put you in a strange place with other complete strangers. And I mean, that's, you know, a little hyperbole, but those are the things that these guardians deal with. And to do that, in a virtual setting, I think is impossible. And that's gonna be a, a big hurdle to overcome to establish that type of uh, humanistic 
rapport, that actually that actual one-on-one -on -one contact that you need to develop trust and and understanding. Uh, you know, a lot of our our uh, wards are suffering from dementia. There's suspicion that goes on. There's a, a complete lack of understanding. And it's so important to be able to make that one-on-one -on -one contact. And I think that's going to be a, 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 big, a big hurdle to overcome. So question for the rest of the panel in, in light of those kind of challenges. And it's certainly been the experience that, that we've had as a guardian um, <laughs> in the new cases that we've accepted. Does it change the way that you think about, um, you know, guardian success or their ability to handle a case? Has it changed at all the way that you interact and what you expect from guardians during this time period? What about uh, Judge James? Looks like maybe you uh, were nodding along slightly to it, so I'll, I'll put you on the spot. No, oh, not a problem. I think that I have become more patient um, because I understand that it is difficult to get things in place to uh, protect the individuals whom I am, um, who come before me. I, most of my cases are low asset, moderate asset individuals. And uh, so I'm working primarily with community guardians. Um, and things are just, you know, it's, it's slower. Um, and it takes longer to get things in place. And unfortunately, all the while, particularly for the most, uh, you know, difficult, egregious cases, that's hard for me to accept because the longer it takes for services to be put in place, uh, you know, that means that individual is, is continuing, continuing to be at risk. Um, and many of my cases, actually nearly all of my cases involve a housing component. Um, so that means that, uh, you know, it, it affects my ability to settle the housing case. The longer it takes to get services in place for the uh, for the individual, meaning if it's a nuisance situation um, and nothing is being done to abate the nuisance situation, a landlord is less likely, uh, no matter how hard I press, um, to want to agree to settle a matter. Any other responses from, from the panel in terms of um, how you've approached dealing with guardians who are, are kind of struggling with this? And um, I'll add a little bit of a wrinkle to it, which is uh, it's been especially challenging time I think it was acknowledged before just with the number of clients who have passed away um, and the final accounting procedures and just the fact that, you know, practitioners are people and they're dealing with the deaths of, of people that they've worked with for very long periods of time and it can be very challenging. Any thoughts about how to kind of handle that from the bench and, and to um, help support guardians in that way? Well, John, I, I really think that um, most of everyone involved with guardianships um, has uh, taken a deep breath and has tried to relax and understand that things are going to take time. And as Judge James said, it can be really frustrating at times, especially when you're dealing with someone that's at risk. But we do understand, I mean, when this pandemic broke out, it broke out just before um, annual accountings would do. Annual accountings are due in May, right? We had to figure out how can we expect the guardians to file annual accountings when they are not permitted by law to see their attorneys to meet with their accountants that was back in uh the early stages of the pandemic where pretty much everything was shut down so we had to extend um the time uh for filings of the accountings we adapted i think that we continue to adapt that we understand that there's going to be some delay honestly one of the biggest frustrations with me is with the federal government and their delay with social security I, they they had a delay pre-pandemic and i think the delay is just tenfold since the pandemic and for some reason i'm not exactly sure it's related to the pandemic um but we we've dealt with it and as, as judge otley mentioned with respect to e-file um as the other as my colleagues mentioned with respect to doing now virtual hearings as opposed to in-person hearings you know it was difficult at first um there's always a resistance and nervousness about change but as judge otley said we're working out all the all the kinks to all of these problems uh we're becoming uh really um uh great Im imagination 
uh, to come up with ways sometimes to go forward with your hearings. Um, and yes, there are some kinks, but we're working them out. You know, one of the advantages of this virtual is that we used to have snow days, and especially with our cases, if it was a bad snow day, you knew you weren't doing any of your hearings because your alleged incapacity persons were not making it to the courthouse. We would have had a number of snow days this past winter. We didn't have any. A foot and a half a foot of snow outside, I still went forward with all of my hearings. Everybody was virtual. There was no reason not to. A nursing homes, rehab facilities, hospitals, everybody's becoming equipped more with iPads and, and ways to sign up to teams. We're working on, as Judge Otley mentioned, problems with respect to e-file. Um, we see the obstacles. It's taking time. We're responding, and I think fairly quickly. And one thing with respect to individuals who have passed, and I don't know if this is public knowledge, but the um, I believe it's the office the, uh, for the court administration, the office of uh, fiduciary, the inspector general's office, fiduciary services. When this pandemic broke and we started losing so many people, uh, the IG's office itself was obtaining from all the different um, public administrators, individuals who had passed uh, that didn't have families. And they were running them by the various clerks in the different courthouses to see if they had guardians to ensure that if someone who passed had a guardian, had a proper burial. Um, we, that was something that was, was never done pre-pandemic and that was instituted by the uh, Inspector General and everybody chipped in. We're working with what we have and I think we, we're succeeding. I think we've been very successful. Well, I couldn't have, have scripted the transition any better, Judge, because I want to shift the focus now to looking forward to, to the future. And this question um, goes to Judge Sokoloff. Um, clearly, we are not on the other side of the pandemic, but there are some glimmers of normalcy as more New Yorkers are becoming vaccinated and some of the restrictions are being lifted. Uh, what do you see as the post-COVID future for guardianship and, and how is that going to be influenced by the experiences that we've had during the pandemic, both good and bad? Well, I think the fact that we have adapted so well to video that, um, that that will always be a component or available to us in the future. I think it's less likely that we're going to be doing hospital and bedside hearings in the future when we've learned that with video availability, um, we can handle things very more than adequately. Um, when we used to have to go to someone's home or into a nursing home, um, that meant a court officer, my clerk, the court reporter, and I would have to be picked up in a van and driven someplace, park, get there, hold the hearing, and then the reverse would happen and half a day or more would be lost on, on something that perhaps took an hour or less. Um, some, sometimes there are obviously hearings that take a lot more time than that. Um, now we can do that without having to spend all that time in transit, uprooting everyone, um, having to get back before five o'clock so that we don't have to pay the, the court officer or the um, court reporter overtime. Um, and also, um, quite frankly, for the safety of everyone, just before the, the pandemic, I didn't realize it, but I came down with a very mild case of shingles. And I had walked through a nursing home and exposed everybody that I passed to that, to that virus. Um, and why should we do that? Now, when we realize that for the most part, we can do this all very, very um, um, safely. And I think that even though things will get better and we're obviously gonna be opening up uh, for in-person cases and for in-person trials and for in-person hearings in the future, that there's always gonna be concern with this pandemic or the next pandemic. And I, I think that it's unlikely 
that we're going to be at least, I will say for my own self, I, I don't think I would want to do that again, to go bedside um, when we can do what we do so well um, from our own courtrooms or in front of our own video cameras. Also, uh, quite frankly, we, I've had cases during this pandemic where somebody did not have um, access to internet service um, in their own homes um, because they chose not to or because something was going wrong. And they came down to the courthouse. And in New York County, we had a special courtroom set up that was um, uh, quasi pandemic proofed. And they sat in there on a video feed, you know, and I was in another part of the courthouse or the court system. Um, and we held the hearing um, and we accommodated it. And I think that with um, technology, um, I think certain things will change. Um, I personally, we, we actually had a discussion um, when we um, did the launch of the guardianship initiative about uh, court evaluators and home visits. Many of my evaluators still made home visits throughout the pandemic. Um, they put on their protection and they went in to see, most of the times there were not other people there, but sometimes there were. But they wanted to see where the AIP lived, if the, particularly if the AIP was in a hospital or a nursing home. Um, and um, it, there was a debate amongst the four of us. Some of us thought court evaluators should still go out because that's the only way to really see what's going on. Others were willing to accept court evaluators who did not. Um, so that's certainly a practice that'll be questioned. Um, I personally think as long as it's safe, you know, not, not in the raging part of a pandemic, but um, that, that court evaluators should uh, make visits to the home to see what's going on, uh, what it looks like. Sometimes that's the only way you see, find out if the AIP has assets, is to find their mail. Um, and um, actually, um, I'll tell you a quick funny story, um, if you don't mind. And I had a case where um, during the pandemic, uh, a 40-year-old uh, um, uh, Down syndrome man um, and his father were both transported uh, to the hospital with um, COVID and they were both very sick. The father died. He was that person, the Down syndrome man's sole um, caretaker. And there was no information about him. And the court evaluator um, was able to get the key and go into the home. And the home had a trap on the door because uh, the, 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 the gentleman with Downs would try to escape. And when he tried to get out, he couldn't get out of the apartment and had to go down the fire escape. Um, that was obviously above and beyond. Um, but we were very grateful to him because he was able to, to determine whether or not there were any relatives to find a phone book to see if the, the father had any money in a bank account. Um, so I, I think it's very important that court evaluators as much as possible, still go to the home. We have uh, time for one more uh, question before we um, turn to the, the Q&A portion of this. And this question is for you, Judge James. We spent our time this evening really talking about the impact of COVID-19 on the guardianship system. And I, I wanna flip that dynamic a little bit and ask you, how do you think that the guardianship system can have a positive impact on uh, our public health system in the future in another public health emergency? God forbid another one comes to pass. Oh, Judge, I think you're uh, muted. You're, at, you're right. Thank you. Sorry about that. So to continue with what Judge Sokoloff is just saying, uh, my colleagues and I worked throughout the pandemic uh, tirelessly, and we could not have done it 
without the attorneys, the paraprofessionals, the social workers, case managers who worked alongside with us courageously, admirably, consistently during the height. Um, you know, and at times putting their own uh, health at risk, right? Um, but it was necessary in order to protect the vulnerable population that we all serve. Uh, whether it's granting the guardianship, denying the guardianship, or fashioning some other remedy in between. Um, I think that the lessons that we learned, at least I pray that the lessons that we learned, the skills that we've acquired, will be readily uh, applicable to any future um, crises. Uh, if nothing else, we've certainly learned that we are um, flexible and are capable, perhaps with some resistance, but learning and adapting to serve those um, whom we are, you know, fortunate uh, to be charged with the, with the privilege to, to, to serve. Uh, you know, when I hear your question, I, I have to say that I, you know, I, I'm gonna take judicial license and just say, I, I wish that the health care system um, would do more to aid us <laughs> in, uh, in this, in, in our endeavor, meaning um, it just takes so long before cases uh, are, are brought to our attention. And uh, that means that if something more restrictive could have been in place, we've lost that opportunity to do so because it's taken so long. Or um, worst case scenario, or in the more, more terrible situations, uh, an individual continues to remain at risk. Um, I know that the court uh, is discussing, some of my colleagues have been discussing, considering uh, ways in which to um, serve individuals without having to um, deal with a full penalty and uh, um, requirements of a full guardianship, meaning um, through Article 8116V, I think the uh, NILAG, and I'm not really sure Vera is part of that as well, but just um, where there are situations where we can avoid a full guardianship, but still uh, service individuals with like a, a basically a one shot situation where just consent is needed for a procedure or whether uh, an individual just needs some um, asset planning to qualify for Medicaid so that um, the individual can receive services in the home. I mean, those are ways in which uh, we're thinking about how to service um, the vulnerable population um, that we see every day. Uh, it, it's frustrating for me though. I mean, I had a personal experience literally just this weekend, a relative of mine, um, 86, fell injured herself. It's the second time in six months that she's done that. Um, I took her to the hospital, Mount Sinai. Brain bleed, uh, various lacerations and injuries to her face. Um, a frail individual. Uh, you know, all the check marks that you would think um, a hospital or a social worker who's working within the hospital uh, would pause before discharging her um, to make sure that she is safe when she goes home. And I even called to say, you know, before you discharge her, can we talk about uh, what sort of services we can put in place for her and to see if there is anything. Just, you know, broach the conversation because she shuts me down whenever I try to have it with her. And it wasn't done. And um, I can imagine how many other individuals, I mean, thankfully she has me, she has others, but I can just imagine how many other individuals like her um, who are sent out. Um, and that was a prime opportunity where uh, we could have intervened um, to make sure that things could be placed, put in place for her that would obviate the need for a full guardianship. So um, that, that's, those are my thoughts. And I can- how much I can do Curious how much of people think that this is partly a product of the lack of, of understanding and knowledge about issues of capacity and the guardianship system uh, amongst policymakers, people in public health, 
Um, and if it is a factor, how do we educate people about that and make them see uh, more than just the scandals and guardianship abuse that seems to get headlines? Judge Sokoloff? Um, I, I would like to follow up a little bit on what Judge James just said. I think that we're going to see a lot of changes in terms of how hospitals, um, both public and private, um, act in the future. It used to be that whenever there was a person who didn't have capacity or they were unsure of um, safe uh, discharge, that they would bring a proceeding, but they all seem to be hurting terribly. And um, they're not as eager to do that as they used to be. Um, a case that came before me, a person was in a nursing, uh, a, a, a skilled nursing facility after a hospitalization. And the social worker actually um, encouraged this person's son who lived 2,000 miles away to move for guardianship instead of the nursing facility doing so, which would have been the way it would be done in the past. And also I've noticed, whereas hospitals used to be a little bit more flexible with dealing with people who had no assets while benefits were applied for, or um, PRUCOL, uh, people who had citizenship issues and PRUCOL benefits were applied for. They're not so cooperative anymore. And, it's, and the excuse I've been told is that they're all under tremendous pressure. Um, and I, I think that's gonna affect us for some time in the future um, and make it a lot uh, more difficult um, for all of us. Are we about to see a big influx of, of petitions coming from these institutional petitioners who have been forbearing on bringing actions during the pandemic? They've been bringing them during the pandemic, but I, don't, I think they're bringing them less, even though people need them, because they're getting pressure not to do it. I mean, they're, the, the, the money people are telling the law firms, you know, we don't want to do this, we don't want to do that. Um, normally they would pay the services of the court evaluator up to a certain amount. Now, now they're not so eager to do that. Often they would waive their fees at the end. Now they want to be paid. Um, I, I just think it's going to be a lot more difficult um, to take care of these people um, who in most cases are incapacitated and do need help because the hospitals can't assist, can't keep them a little bit longer until their benefits are obtained so they can be transferred to another place for long-term care or whatever they might need, um, can't have um, full-time uh, nursing, can't be sent home with appropriate um, home helper care because they're not willing to wait for uh, Medicaid to be applied for. Um, it, it, it's going to affect how things work in the future. Well, I, you know, I understand what you're saying, Judge. I have but not. But you seen, disagree. <laughs> uh, no, I'm just saying I haven't seen that in Brooklyn. In fact, um, a case that I just had yesterday, I spoke to the um, hospital and I said, "Listen, I need to make sure that the court evaluator is paid." please offline discuss this and see if the hospital will pick up the payment because there weren't any assets. So when I got the um, final order and judgment for signature, I see that they had worked it out. And that's something that prior to getting on for the hearing, my law clerk usually will ask the question, okay, here's what the situation is. How are we going to pay the court evaluator um, have you had this discussion? Well, initially she didn't have the discussion, but they were able to work it out. I always ask the question, and I guess Brooklyn is a little bit different, um, but the hospitals normally work it out, um, and they have been bringing cases because they are concerned about a safe discharge. Now, for me, the issue is when we don't have anybody, 
is how do I make that happen? And what I see in terms of the part 36 list is that we don't have a lot of geriatric care managers who could make that happen and work with the hospitals um, and who there's one that she's fantastic and I'm not giving her name because <laughs> I want to keep her, but anyway, you'll discover her. Um, and she works with me all the time, even in terms of with her fee because she's passionate about it and she wants this to work out. Um, so I think it's just, again, the, the prodding and, the conversation with the individuals who really are advocates for people who need the help. So they're going to either waive their fee and we have to watch out for them later on when there is a case that has the ability to pay them. So um, I see it a little bit different in Brooklyn, but I do agree with you. Thank you, Judge. And I um, don't want to give a uh, short shrift to our attendees. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Stu Sherman, who's going to come back and pose some questions for the panel um, from our attendees Q&A. So Stu, take it away. Great. Thanks, John. Um, so there's been a lot of really great questions. Uh, probably only have a ch chance to answer some of them. Um, the first one uh, is coming from Peter Strauss. Um, can we truly provide fairness and constitutionally protected rights when CEs, counsel, and yes, judges cannot be physically present with an AIP during a hearing? How does counsel have a private discussion with her or his client? Um, are we satisfied with the seemingly necessary solution of hearings? I'll, I'll address that if you don't mind. Um, we're in, look, is it the ideal situation? No, would you prefer to have an attorney sitting next to their client uh, during the course of a hearing? Yes, absolutely. The same thing as in a criminal matter where you would want the attorney next to the criminal defendant so that he, can he or she can communicate with that person. Uh, but we've made inroads to try and cure any defects. Again, it's not um, perfect, but we now have uh, in the system that the court uses, the team system, we now have what are called breakout rooms. And I've been using them all week where I've used it just before getting on here today where I needed an attorney to speak with um, their client and my clerk was able to put them into a uh, separate room with no one else and they were able to contact us by email when they were ready to come back in. It's amazing. If, as I said earlier, it's like Star Trek. You're being zapped from one place to the other. Is it ideal? Is it perfect? No, but it beats having someone being in a facility and not being able to get out. I think that's more of a curtail of someone's freedom, being locked out, being locked up and not having to be able to get before the court. This way, at least they are able to get before the court safely. And we, we've also, um, I'm sorry, I jumped in before you. I um, we, we've we've um, also, um, had people um, take themselves off video and mute themselves while everybody takes a break and the attorney and the AIP consult with each other over the telephone and then we come back. So they've been able to have their private conversation when necessary and then we come back and we're all present and there. I mean, you, you can work it out. We've done it and I don't believe anyone's uh, rights have been impinged upon. Um, so. I was going to say the same thing. Um, and in fact, I allot additional time for these hearings now. So a hearing that would have taken an hour, hour and a half, I allot two hours, right? Just so that we can pause, um, whether it's turn your camera off and mute yourself or actually log off, speak to your attorney and come back in 10 minutes. Um, it's just too important to make sure that individuals due process rights are protected. Um, while also ensuring that everyone else is safe too. Um, great. So the next question is a compendium. Pe people have asked this in different ways, but how have restrictions on visitation impacted the ability to assess capacity for judges and court examiners? Or in your opinion, have they uh, impacted that ability? Well, 
Well, actually, that question needs should be addressed to uh, Judge Diamond um, in Nassau County because that's one of his things that that upsets him so much is that yes, we did have a, a great deal of uh, limited uh, contact for a period of time while individual while while the nursing homes were on lockdown, while the hospitals were uh, so restrictive with visitation, um, and that was a problem. There were a lot of problems that. Uh, Fortunately, we're short term when the pandemic first hit to give everyone an opportunity to work out a way around and a way to proceed safely. Um, and I think the nursing homes have adjusted, they have adapted. Sometimes we've had to come down a little hard on them, telling a facility that was charging someone $10,000 a month to stay there that they really needed to invest in an iPad for the facility so that they could do virtual hearings. As a matter of fact, I think I ordered them to invest in the iPad, um, but I think they, they, they've all adapted uh, to the limitations. Again, not ideal, not perfect. We did not like uh, being restricted from our wards uh, for any period of time because they are our wards, but we had to adapt and I, I think that we did. And I look at this all in the terms of we're in the we were we were we still are in the midst of a pandemic we have to do we have to make sure people's rights are protected but we have to do it safely yeah i i'd like to just harken back to what judge james said i mean we have to be more patient uh you know if if uh someone couldn't meet with a party or or with their uh with their client you know, we, I would just give an, an adjournment and we would try and keep a short, a short leash on it and maybe make it only a couple of days or a week's adjournment, but you have to be able to pivot and where you would normally want to go through with the hearing, you have to be understanding and say, okay, time, the time of COVID. And, you know, if you need uh, a couple of days to, to try and meet uh, or, you know, work out a uh, technical glitch or get a, a laptop or an iPad or iPhone to your, your client, you know, we have to accommodate them. But I do think, as Judge Troyer said, everyone has really did yeoman's work in adapting. Uh, apart from the technological aspect, I've had caseworkers that have shown up at uh, their clients' homes, the IPs, uh, AIPs' homes, in full protective gear. I mean, head to toe covered, but just so they could get there because this person didn't have access and needed to, to be represented somehow. And again, it's just a, a matter of being able to pivot and adapt and, uh, and the compassion that everyone that's involved in these cases shows that we know that this is important. We know these people are vulnerable. It has to get done. We're going to figure out a way to get it done. And it just basically requires that patience. Um, a related question um, from Felice Wechsler. Um, many AAPs have cognitive impairments and are vision or hearing impairments and therefore have difficulty communicating via small flat screens. Do you agree that bedside hearings be held for these individuals if they're unable to travel to court? And I guess the, the adding to that, um, in the future post COVID, do you see bedside hearings coming back? Um, or do you see them um, uh, being replaced in a way by the technological innovations that have come? Well, I, the, I think that they've already been replaced. Um, and again, I've had where the facility has accommodated the court and everyone else in terms of like Judge Troyer said, if you have an iPad, you have some sort of device where the um, AIP is able to sign on have the privacy and um, participate if in fact they're able to participate or where the appearance hasn't, hasn't been waived. I've had several um, hearings where the IP, uh, the AIP was able to sign on um, where the hospital even accommodated in having um, uh, the family member inside a room, the community room with the protective gear and so on and so forth. So I think again, that when everyone is cooperating and making sure that their, their voices are heard, that it's working and that it, it, it can remain that way. Um, in terms of bedside hearings, um, I don't believe now that we have teams in place or any other type of form in place that is virtual, 
that it's going to be necessary to go into the actual facility. I think that we have now the ability where most of the facilities are equipped um, to handle what would have been a bedside hearing is now a virtual hearing. So I think that we'll continue at that, um, that type of forum. And we've held hearings with real time so that whatever the court reporter is typing is typed out on the screen for the AIP to see. So they can, if they had hearing issues, they could actually read what was being said in real time. Um, I've done that quite a few times and it's worked out pretty well um, uh, for people who've had profound hearing losses. And I think Teams has a uh, transcript uh, uh, provision. You can, you can uh, click on it and it transcribes in real time. And it, it's pretty accurate from what, what we've seen. Um, question from uh, Sonia Middleman uh, related to this as well. Uh, the APs and petitioners are among the least likely to have access to updated tech, uh, technology. Are there any public places available where they can go in order to be able to effectively participate in proceedings over teams? Um, or in general, are there uh, technological access issues that you've seen or foresee in the future? Well, as I, I mentioned before, in Supreme New York, we actually have available fully um, spaces for individuals who don't have access to technology to come in and be protected and to participate in the hearing. Um, so, you know, we, we're always adapting and trying to figure out um, how to best make sure everyone can be included. Every, every single Supreme Court within the city, and this was our Deputy Chief Administrative Judges, uh, Judge Silver and uh, uh, Edwina, uh, both made sure uh, initially when this pandemic hit that every courthouse had a room available that anyone can go into to have access uh, to the internet to have ex access to Teams. That I think at the time we were using Skype, now we're, now we're using Teams, but every single Supreme Court does have access to that, that an individual can go into. And I think all of us have used it. I, I can't imagine any county that hasn't used it yet. Right, the next question um, is more of a, a public health question. Um, do you foresee a situation where evaluators are required to get vaccines before home visits, possibly requiring vaccinations for AIPs as well? And the general question is, what is the mechanism to ensure safety for both evaluators and AIPs? And that's coming from uh, Christopher Martin. I mean, I, ideally, yes, we'd love everybody to get vaccinated. I mean, the, the judges can't get vaccinated unless you're, you know, over 65 or have a some underlying comorbidity. So, you know, it, it, that we would love to be able to do that. If I could, if I could sign an order, I'd sign it right now. But uh, I, I don't see a way to do that in, until the vaccines are readily available to anyone that wants it. Uh, then the question might become, can we order uh, that a court evaluator or, you know, a court attorney uh, has to have the vaccine before they can uh, go on with their duties, and that that you know that issue touches on a lot of uh, a lot of uh, aspects as far as you know privacy and uh, maybe religious beliefs, uh, whether we can uh, foist that upon someone. But it's, it's a real consideration if you're going to be interacting with somebody in a vulner that's vulnerable uh, or in a vulnerable setting. Maybe you need to be vaccinated before you you embark upon those duties. The, the vaccine protects people from um, getting so ill that they have to be hospitalized or die, and it adds to herd immunity, um, but it doesn't necessarily protect others in the same room. Um, and I can't imagine that we'd ever be requiring people to get vaccinated. I think we all hope that people want to be vaccinated and that with the third vaccine coming on so quickly that all of you um, can be vaccinated, 
um, if you haven't already been vaccinated. So. But inherent in that question is an interesting point that we as judges are sending court evaluators into the homes of individuals and possibly exposing them to, you know, uh, risk. Um, and, and I guess that's something that um, we just need to weigh when we are determining what has to be done or should be done um, for our cases. They get a hazard stipend, maybe, or something. <laughs> um, so I think we have uh, time for one more question. So I'll ask a, a very broad one that was uh, coming from, from Beth. Um, what do you see as the future of guardianship? Uh, people are going to continue to grow old and infirm. They're going to be around, you know, like I said, like the post office. and we're going to have to continue to adapt and pivot as uh, circumstances demand. Uh, I don't think that we're ever going back to the straight uh, in person uh, on everything. I think there's going to be some sort of hybridization. I know my calendar runs very smoothly on, in a virtual setting, um, but who knows what the future is going to hold. I think as Judge Sokolov said, you know, this pandemic, the next pandemic, the next thing that creates an impact, but society is going to continue to get old and infirm and we're going to, there'll always be a need for the guardianships, I think. I think there's always going to be need for guardianships. If anything, I think that while um, the pandemic may not have had an effect on individuals that are suffering from dementia in terms of uh, increasing individuals getting dementia, I think that the pandemic certainly has had an effect on, indiv on individuals' mental health. And we also deal with, you know, our guardianship cases are not restricted just to individuals suffering from dementia. It also includes individuals suffering from mental health issues, in addition, of course, to uh, physical impairments. But sometimes the mental actually not sometimes, most times, the mental health cases are the most difficult to deal with. And I think those what we're going to see an, up, uh, an increase uh, in. And we've also seen, at least we've seen, I've seen an increase in um, pro se applications because individuals are, there are a great number more individuals suffering uh, from the economic impact. And I've seen an uptake in uh, pro se applications because individuals just don't have the funds to go to an attorney. And Mr. Sherman, perhaps your agency can help us because we'd love to have an agency that we could refer individuals that appear pro se to. Um, well, well we're, we're just getting started, but uh, you know, <laughs> as we've found, there is a very big need for it. Um, so what, uh, one last question for uh, Judge James. Um, you know, there's a, we're in the midst of a housing crisis. The pandemic has created a, uh, a potential wave of evictions with the uh, moratorium on evictions, possibly when it might end. Um, do you see um, that, that wave coming and that impact being impacted by um, guardianship um, or the greater need for guardianship? Well, for my part, it, it hasn't stopped. And just, just like for my colleagues, it, it hasn't stopped. So yes, there is the moratorium on actual evictions, but you know, there is the caveat um, within that moratorium where certain nuisance behaviors um, can allow um, a judge to uh, let a case go forward to eviction, meaning to actually have an individual who is incapacitated and uh, causing a nuisance to actually be put out of his or her home. Um, I expect to see uptake certainly in the number of cases. Um, and as Judge Troya was just saying, the 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 monetary cases are, are easy in comparison. It's the mental health ones that are that are so much more difficult. Um, so um, you know, it, it's my hope that more people will are willing to to work with us because we are in dire need of, of finding um, guardians, uh, certainly court evaluators for those pro se applications. Um, uh, I, I am fortunate in that I serve in a 
in a what used to be called a hybrid part. So many of my cases are brought by DSS, which means that uh, there there's some limited, 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 limited monies available to 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 appoint people in these cases. Um, but you know we are ready and we are expecting to see more cases come May. Um, so we're we're running short on time. Does anyone have any last thoughts they'd like to add before we uh, conclude for the evening? I don't know if you can beat Judge James's ending just now. <laughs> I'm sorry, that was mm -hmm. perfect. Um, great. Well, um, I want to thank you all for coming. Um, We've uh, limited time, so I'll wrap it up and give some final words on this. Um, I want to thank all the panelists uh, for being here, for spending their evening with us, uh, for speaking to everyone out there. Um, it's, been, it's been a pleasure. It's been incredibly insightful. Uh, this has been a uh, very difficult year in many ways, a very tragic year. And you know, I think as everyone has identified prior to this year, there was a greater need for assistance in many areas including assisting low-income individuals. Uh, and there's you know, a need for additional um, assistance in petitioning and guardians, a greater diversity. And all these issues have been amplified by the pandemic. Um, you know, we've seen COVID-19 upending many of the protections we had in place. And there's been a lot of need for rapid adaptation. Um, it's been very impressive to hear from everyone here about what you've been doing, how you've been able to adapt, um, what some of the lessons learned are going forward for the future and uh, what, might, what might be uh, beneficial with the technological changes, but also uh, what might need to, to resume or what still needs uh, improvement. Um, also wanted to uh, end the evening, I wanna thank uh, the moderator, John uh, Holt for doing such a fantastic job. Um, and the- Of course, that's uh, when I'm muted, thank you, Stu. <laughs> <laughs> um, also, there's been a, a number of people to help put this together, both from uh, the, Guardian, the Project Guardianship and uh, New York Legal Assistance Group, uh, Beth Williams, Randy Reckman, Kimberly George, Susan DeMeo, Adele uh, Dacha. Um, thank you all for putting together what has been an, a fantastic evening. Um, and uh, just want to mention to everyone um, that the next event will be in June. Um, we are putting together the coalition that we've been discussing, um, and uh, we will have three more events throughout the year uh, on different topics. Um, we're excited to have some of you back. Um, and then I'm going to throw in, if you're interested in joining the coalition, um, I put the link in the chat. Um, click on that, and it will send you to a form that you can fill out if you'd like to join and be part of the coalition we're building. Um, I think this was a really incredible first uh, meeting and webinar uh, to really set the tone for what I think will be great collaborations. Um, in addition, um, be on the lookout. There will be a post-event survey. Uh, we'll be asking people that per, uh, attended through email to provide uh, your feedback on this uh, and also uh, more on you know, the shape the coalition you think might take. Uh, if you have signed up for that, um, we'll be, you know, be on the lookout for an email so we can have a meeting to, to discuss that going forward. Um, with that, um, I need to conclude. Unfortunately, we do have to end. Um, again, thank you all so much for coming out. Uh, this has been spectacular and I uh, really appreciate uh, you all being here. Thank you very much, everyone. It's a pleasure. Thank, everyone. thank Bye -bye. you. Take care. Take care, everyone. Have a good evening. Thank you so much. Bye -bye. Good evening. Thank you.